how is everybody today? Good. 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 Oh, excellent, excellent. Oh. Welcome here. Uh, I am Phyllis Drury. I am the president of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum Board, and so that's why I get to stand up here and welcome you to our little museum. Uh, you'll see some things are in sort of disarray because last night we had a very exciting harvest dinner which some of you were at mm. and i think it was a, a very uh, good um, program for everybody people seemed to enjoy it and we had a lot of people here so uh, that was good to see people out and playing games as well as having good food so we uh, thank all that came and, and hope that maybe if we do it again next year, more people will show up too. So what's going on today? Today we are fortunate enough to have Paul Gillis, a historian of Vermont legal history, a co-founder of the Vermont Judicial, Judical, right? No, Judicial. Judicial. Sorry, it's my age. Historical Society and the Vermont Institute for Government. A former Vermont Deputy Secretary of State, he is presently the moderator of the town of Berlin and a partner in the Montpelier law firm Tarrant, Gillis, Merriman, and Richardson. Paul has published numerous books and articles including Uncommon Law, Ancient Roads, and Other Ruminations on Vermont Legal History, published in 213 by the Vermont Historical Society. Some of you may remember Paul from his two previous appearances at the homestead, All Rise, Standing Up to Vermont Judicial History in January of 2014, and Vermont's Leased Lands of January of 2017. Please join me in welcoming Thank you. And thank you for giving me an opportunity to talk about something that's been uh, compelling in my life the last six months. I've, I finished a history of the courts of Vermont and it's now somewhere deep in the editing process and I felt as though I needed to go on to something entirely different. I've been writing about legal history and Vermont legal history for 30 years, and I thought, well, we should try cleansing the palate and trying something different. And it, all along, people that I've talked to have known about this source, this elections, uh, election sermon set. There's, there was uh, 60, uh, 60, 61 sermons given between 1778 and 1834. Then they stopped and 18 years later they tried it again for three or four years. It was a one hour sermon, often given, it would be given to the governor, lieutenant governor, council, legislature, and all the ministers that could come from the state. And it would be, uh, you'd, most of the ministers would know a, a, year, a year in advance. So this would be a big deal they would be working on. This would be the most important sermon that they ever gave in the most public place in front of all these other ministers who couldn't help, I suppose, but judge them. So we have this very ripe, and mo by the way, most of these sermons are available online, so you can read them yourselves. Um, but before I get into that subject, I, because we're here in Ethan's home, I thought I should at least put into context where Ethan is coming from. Ethan would, if his spirit is around today, he would be driving us out of here because he didn't like churches and ministers, he was against those, but he was a deist, and that's, you can buy his Reason, the Only Oracle of Man in there. I recommend it. It's not well written, and it's kind of goofy in places, but he was, uh, he says in that book that he has never read anything else. This is his own idea. It came out of nowhere. And I think it's important because actually some of the sermons talk about deism, uh, but deism is not atheism, the way they call it to, to be so. The deist, deism is a, is a religion. Uh, they, uh, deists, deists read the Bible, although they didn't believe it to be divinely inspired. They have nothing to do with miracles. Jesus was not divine and there was no trinity, no such thing as miracles. Deists, deists worshipped God and in worship found a moral basis for a li living in reason. Uh, now, this did not go over well with some of the traditionalists. <laughs> Timothy Dwight of Yale called it 
contemptible plagiarism of every hackneyed, worn out, half rotten dogma of the English deistical writers. He said reason was the first formal publication the US openly directed against the Christian religion. Ben Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they were all deists. And uh, of course, Ethan was the most notorious. Um, he, uh, in that book, if you read it, he, he, he's troubled by Noah's Ark. He doesn't buy that. He thinks uh, that, that Sunday should be, Saturday should be Sunday, and Sunday should not be the uh, holy day. And uh, he said in that book, I am no Christian except mere baptism make me one. He, now, he was raised in a family where they read the Bible every day, and he learned the Bible and the and uh, the phrases of it. And when, what's most notable about uh, Ethan Allen is that he had this remarkable way of saying things that were sort of an aphoristic uh, statement. So one of the more famous lines to the uh, Attorney General of, of New York after he loses the big case, he says, the gods of the valleys are not the gods of the hills. And the Attorney General says, well, what's that mean? And he says, you come up and I'll show you what I mean. That's straight out of the Book of Kings. Now, in 1816, Reverend Samuel Austin, one of our election seminar, a sermon folks, who was also the president at UVM at the time, called deism earthy, sensual, and devilish, making a combined and formidable effort to overturn Christianity and to substitute in its place the worship of reason, or rather, to support an unqualified atheism. And in 1817, Reverend Panias Peck said, for religion to have a universal influence, it must be free of idolatry. It must reject efforts to overturn Christianity and to substitute in its place the worship of reason. Um, and there are others. Now, one way to look at this subject, I think, and, and I can't help but say that this concept of reason as opposed to the traditional Christ Protestant uh, Christian view of things is necessarily uh, reflected in the sermons themselves. In fact, you could look at the sermons in many cases as an attempt to apply reason to justify the uh, Christian religion. Uh, so you have this, uh, so now I've gone to see, I was just playing around on the net this morning and I found a headline that said that of all the states, Vermont has the worst church attendance in the country. 17% show up regularly. And then I found another which said that uh, uh, the, uh, well, they were che checking to see what people thought. So 41% of Vermonters are absolutely certain of a belief in God, 26% are fairly certain, and 21% don't. Now that's not a deist or, or, or the traditional Protestants. And uh, as far as going to heaven, 47 percent say they're likely to go. I think I've got that wrong. Uh, 56 percent believe in heaven, 37 percent don't, 38 percent believe in hell, and 53 percent don't. So there's a kind of favoritism there. So, now uh, today we think of the uh, process of the federal constitution separating church and state. We have the same thing in the, in the Vermont constitution. And yet in early Vermont, we had a system which was unusually un, uh, ec economical, <laughs> ecumenical. Um, so in order for you to serve in the legislature, you had to take an oath that said you believe in one God, the creator of governor, the governor in, of the universe, the rewarder of good and the punisher of the wicked, and you would acknowledge that the scriptures of the Old and New Testament were given by divine inspiration. And you had to own and profess the Protestant religion. And then, beginning in 1791, with an article in the Constitution that says we should separate church and state, we declared that all people in a town must pay for the first settled minister and the church, despite what they felt. So they were obliged to support the ministry at that point. That, and this stayed in effect until 1807. And during the course of these uh, sermons that, that uh, we're reading, uh, this comes up frequently. So the Congregationalists like this law because most of the churches are 
Congregationalists of Vermont, and they're the beneficiaries of this, and the Baptists hate it, and they, they think it's wrong. But the overriding theme of these sermons is this relationship between religion and government. Some of these uh, sermons are not what you would call barn burners, but some of them are really quite wonderful in the way they look at things. And so I thought maybe I could take some time to just go over some of it with you. Now, the, um, one of the things that uh, is important to remember here is that none of the uh, ministers wanted to step into the subject of being lobbyists. They thought it was uh, a little out of their place. So, but what were they to talk about? Well, they were going to talk about the frequent themes are um, you folks who are serving in this, uh, these offices are examples of good Christian life, and if you mess up, the government will topple. Um, there's an unusual amount of uh, tolerance for other religions, except not if you're Catholic. Uh, Catholics are regarded as uh, unchristian somehow, and they, and they take their, their hits in this process. I, I just wanted to start just to lay this out, because even though we have 61 sermons, we have 59 ministers, because two of them gave uh, the, minute, the uh, sermon twice. But even before that, at the Constitutional Convention in July of 1777, the Reverend Aaron Hutchinson gave a sermon before they started working on the Constitution. And uh, it said, this, now one of the things I do here is I'm reading the sermons and then I'm also learning about the, the ministers themselves. And of Hutchinson, it was said that it was believed by those who knew him in Massachusetts and Vermont that if the New Testament had been lost, he could have been restored it from memory in the original Greek. <laughs> these ministers are the most educated people we have in most of these towns. All but mo more than half of them have gone to college, and some of them have gone to uh, Andover Seminary. Hutchinson is, here we are, it's uh, July of 1777, Burgoyne is bringing his troops down the, uh, up the lake, I guess you have to say, because he's coming to the south, and the, the whole state is a war zone. And he speaks from his heart. He says, I know the heart of the oppressed, for I myself have been severely scourged by that iron rod. My life has been threatened and endangered for no other cause but sacrificing my merits and risking my honor in life in defense of my injured, oppressed country. Nothing gives me greater pleasure than to be happily instrumental to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke of injustice and oppression. Um, so we have a variety of different individuals in these ministers. One of, my most, one of the most interesting, I think, is uh, Azariah Chandler, who is the minister in Waitsfield. Now, he is one of three of these ministers who received notice that he was to give the election sermon the night before. Now, this would have put me into a sort of panic, but he was an unusual man. He was a rough character. He believed in the hard life. He, in the wintertime, he would go out and cut a hole in the ice in the pond and, and immerse himself in it be, so that he could feel this uh, pain. He would routinely go barefoot. He slept on the ground in the grass any time of the year. And when he was in college, he had, he went to UVM, and when he arrived at the class, he didn't have any shoes on, and they said, hey, you have to have shoes. So the next day, he went out and brought his shoes in over his shoulder, and they said, <laughs> you can see the kind of mind is. No, you have to have your shoes on your feet. So the next day, he came in, and he had tied his shoes on top of his feet. <laughs> So he's barefoot all the time. His wife said, I can't make him wear, you know. So he gets up the morning of this sermon in Waitsfield. He walks the 20 miles barefoot to Montpelier, where he's giving this sermon. And he walks into the hotel, which was probably the Pavilion Hotel at the time. And everyone laughs hysterically at him. They give him a hard time. He, by the way, he explains this to, uh, in his own writings by saying, that he suspected he had been born barefoot. <laughs> but they think of him as just this, you know, this rube, I think. And his first lines, recognizing that the man who was supposed to be there was the president of UVM and had become sick, this voice comes out of this barefoot, crude man. 
Most deeply, my beloved friends, do I participate in your regret for the afflictive dispensation which has deprived you of your expected labors of abler hands and has drawn me from an obscurity equally appropriate and beloved to officiate on so public and so interesting an occasion. Uh, I didn't want, I, I've, I'm giving voice to these sermons for the first time in more than 200 years. And I have come to cherish the language and cherish the individuals enough so that I imagine that at some point I'm going to try to persuade the friends of the State House to have a, a, uh, an evening, of, like a farmer's night, where we could get the leading pastors of Vermont to give pieces of these sermons so that we could actually hear them. Like, but here is uh, Chandler in, later talking about uh, nations uh, where superstition reigns, whose faith teaches them to expect more from the mass, the crucifix, the absolution of the priest, or the intercession of a dead saint, I think he's talking about the Catholics, then from internal purity and practical godliness, whose earliest maxims teach them to yield their bodies to the monarch's will and their souls to the guidance of pontifical infallibility, where villainy is so common and integrity so rare, that scarcely an individual, but what would in a moment acquire intelligence to understand, or virtue, courage, unanimity, or even conscience to maintain their rights. Now, as I said, I only have, we only have uh, 51 of the sermons. Uh, three or four of them were never published. The rest were published, and yet they've disappeared from the face of the earth. And it's uh, one of the striking things about this study is what they say about us after we're gone. Now these are mostly, well they're all men, they're all ministers, most of them have been, are in a church for 30 or 40 years. They've spent their time um, giving sermons, you know, they give two sermons a week at least. Uh, one of the ministers calculated at the end of his life he had given 8,000 sermons in his time. And he also counted up the number of funerals and weddings and baptisms and services that he had held. So these are professionals. These are people who are used to giving a sermon. Now a sermon, for all of these sermons, almost every one of them follows a set plan. Election sermons have been given in Connecticut and Massachusetts for 150 years before we started doing it. And one of the questions was, well, how did we ever start to do it? It turned out that one of our original founders, Thomas Chittenden, served for seven years in the in the Connecticut legislature and would have sat through seven election sermons. So the first time we have a sermon opportunity, which is 1778 in, in March, we have uh, the Reverend Peter Powers, who's, who comes from, hmm, I can't remember where he comes from. Uh, he has an interesting background in that he, he was asked at one time by the uh, Abnaki Indians who were in the area, if it would be all right if they killed one of their own in the courthouse and whether that was in God's will. This was a, a man named Tumaluk. His parents were, and you'll know these names, Joe and Molly, famous for giving names of pawns over in the Marshfield area. And he had killed uh, a man and been forgiven because he was, uh, he had killed his girlfriend he was trying to kill her suitor and he missed and so they said that was okay that was strike one and then he went to kill someone else and there was some other reason for giving but the third time he did it it was just too much so they said well we're going to have to have our little tribal council and we're going to have him tried and they found that he was guilty and that he should be punished by being executed but they felt uncomfortable living in Vermont a, a, a subject of and they were part of this community. So they went to the judges uh, in Newbury of the, uh, of the Orange County Court, and they said, would this be all right? And they said, well, it's your law, sure. You can use the lobby. And then they went to P Powers, and they said, is this okay? Is it? And he took a, an evening, and he prayed on it, and he said he thought that was right, too. So the, where it worked was the father of the man he had killed put a bullet in his head, and he was buried on the lawn outside of that courthouse. And about 20 years ago when they were repairing the, or redoing the landscaping, they plowed his body up so that this has actually been referred. But Peter Powers was more than just that. And just to give you an idea, what do they look like? His dress on the Sabbath was a curse, 
Kersimir coat with breeches and stockings, a three-cornered hat, a fleece-like wig, a white band, and white silk gloves. But he wasn't a proud man. <coughs> a man named Way, while bringing Reverend Peter Power's goods from Charleston to Newbury, broke through the ice while reaching the Ampampanusik and said, that is a cursed hole. And this was reported to the Reverend who admonished him, demanding that he repent. Why, said Mr. Way, did not the Lord curse the earth for man's sin? Yes, said Powers. Well, replied Way, do you think that little devilish Ampampanusik was an exception? Mr. Powers turned away and exclaimed, Oh, Mr. Way, Mr. Way, I stand in fear of you. <laughs> we, uh, he says, uh, We have but little encouragement from visibility at present. He's, this is, again, war is imminent. All things outward look dark. It is a dark day on account of an unnatural war, a darker on account of the great wickedness of the country. Alas, the drunkenness, profanity, uncleanness, and Sabbath breaking through the land. Oh, what a lamentable decay of vital pi piety, family, religion, and government. How seldom do we find any inquiring the way to Zion. The spirit of conviction and conversion seems apparently to have left the country almost universally. The wise virgins are slumbering and sleeping with the foolish. Some, such an impenetrable hardness of heart prevails that no judgments of heaven seem to make any impression on the wicked, but every day they grow more obdurate and insensible. So now he's established the basic themes that we will hear again and again through these sermons, which is we have a moral corruption because of our depravity. It's seen by Sabbath breaking, blasphemy, not taking the oath of office, and more importantly, the oath for truthfulness in a court seriously. And uh, these are the things that he, these, these are the things that he is really lobbying to ensure that the legislature takes seriously. And it isn't taking seriously because there is, there is no enforcement of these things. Oh, by the way, in case anybody's worried about breaking the Sabbath laws, it was 1894 that they allowed us to travel here when it was prohibited before that, and also that there was a, in, in, actually between 1801 and 1841, it was against the law of Vermont to have any fun. <laughs> uh, that is, no plays, no dances, no public events of any sort other than the sermon, other than the church. And, and it's extremely important to think of this. The sermon, today, it's something that we have in a church service, but in early Vermont, it was the thing. It was the main reason that you would, that the, the only time of the week when everyone would sit down and you would actually listen. It was, and and some, of the, some of the ministers have said it was the most remarkable opportunity to educate and to bring forward some of the principal ideas that they had. Uh, in uh, 1780, a new minister comes to Bennington, David Avery. He brings a slave. They think, uh, hey, just uh, three years ago we abolished slavery here. Uh, you can't have a slave. The person he raised that problem with uh, was excommunicated because of taking that uh, object. But he only lasted three years, and it was a major problem in the church. They finally got rid of him. And when asked to explain why they got rid of him, uh, one of the things they said was that uh, the real source of the controversy was that Reverend Avery walked to church holding his wife's hand, and that showed he lacked humility. Um, Governor Titchener said of him, he, this is more serious, I suppose, he exalts his official prerogatives, lays all the blame upon the opposition, loftily pities their weaknesses, and rebukes their wrongdoing inasmuch as they received the word at his lips with no more meekness, which is the most galling of all, derides their separate origin. We have uh, Joseph Bullen, who comes to Westminster, and he is... Uh, uh, the problem with, uh, in, in most of the cases, these ministers either last forever or they don't last very long. So in the case of Bullen, his usefulness while in Westminster was much impaired by his devotion to money getting. He kept a store, manufactured potash, speculated in land, 
and was considered quite shrewd at the bargain. Um, it's Bullen who, in excommunicating uh, a man named Azariah Wright, who was shot a bear on Sunday, and the report of the gun has been heard at church in the middle of a sermon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they have a little hearing, and they say, you gotta go. And Wright, who was a revolutionary hero, and a pretty rough character anyway, uh, attends the next session of the church, uh, where the reverend is about to read the excommunication order, and he brings his rifle and he points it right at the head of the minister. And there's a moment of chilling uh, stillness. And then uh, Reverend Bullen hands the uh, paperwork to John Sessions, the first deacon. And the gun then moves over to deacon's head. And deacon, deacon Sessions, uh, ready with any kind of uh, situation in church, says, quoting St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, all things are legal, but not all things are expedient, and hands it back to the minister. <laughs> After which everyone flees, and Azariah stays a member of the church. <laughs> now, one of the people I have met in my journey, who I have come to respect more than any other, is Reverend Asa Burton of Thetford. And he was there 40 years. He was a force of uh, religious uh, <coughs> importance in the state. And uh, he, he, there's also a lot more written about him. Um, he, for instance, he wrote his conversion story, which I thought was inspiring in one of his journals. At times, very suddenly, everything around me shone with particular brightness and serene glory. It seemed to penetrate through my soul and fill that with light. Then my mind felt serene and calm as the morning without any agitation or distress. My heart seemed to melt within me and tears would flow plentifully but silently down my cheeks. I experienced inward sweetness and joy too great for utterance." So he was like a star. He had been uh, to Yale. He had studied with the great uh, theologians and he had great opportunities in Connecticut. He was heading for Connecticut but they said, would you just stop by Thetford for uh, just one sermon? This was common that they would move around. And uh, there, what he found there was not inspiring. He later wrote, They appeared to me to be very litigious, quarrelsome, intemperate, immoral, clownish, and vulgar, and in view of towns around, they stood lowest in public estimation. <laughs> but he was told that this would leave him more room to be successful if he pitched where Satan's camp was, and he decided to stay. <laughs> Um, and he was successful. He trained over 60 men for the minister, including the minister that, whose house is down the street from my house in Berlin, James Hobart. Um, he also was successful in welcoming uh, 150 new souls to his church in just one year. They, uh, his biographer said he was not a great orator, but gr his great reasoning power and the clearness with which he presented his subject to the minds of the hearers made a deep and lasting impression. He had a strong view against Methodism, abhorred dancing, and has a special ability to draw the young from vain amusements. Um, he also said that uh, the, it, how important good family government was as the basis for sound civil government. By that means children are fitted by their parents to be orderly and unruly subjects of government. He promoted the development of schools where the operation of self may be restrained, and preachers to lead the way to a better world. And he even found something nice to say about taxes. Taxes, and heavy taxes too, I may say, are of great service to the public wealth, not only by, as by them government is supported, but they oblige us to be industrious and frugal. Uh, we have Lyman Potter, 1787, from Norwich. Um, he has uh, Again, this is, I, you, you go into the, the literature, you find all the things you can find about this in, in, in uh, books and pamphlets and newspapers. And this is what we remember of him is in the history of Norwich. It says, in his pulpit efforts, he does not appear to have been especially happy, his delivery being marred by a slight impediment in speech and by a harsh, shrill voice. He preached long sermons, made long prayers, <laughs> 
and used many long metric hymns in his services. He dressed in the clerical garb of the day with loose and flowing coat skirts, powdered hair, and wore a three-cornered cocked hat of the continental pattern. Being a man of large size and commanding appearance, he was the object of considerable awe. Um, uh, but he too spent too much time farming and then fell into some problems there. Uh, it's interesting that uh, many of these men are described as large or portly. Uh, and in fact, the one minister who is uh, thin, uh, there's a young woman meets him and says, how can you be a minister when you're so skinny? <laughs> so they've come to expect this. Um, we have uh, Samuel Sh Shuttlesworth of Windsor, uh, who uh, wrote in a letter to a friend, oh, this, <laughs> so a friend, uh, uh, someone in, of the pastor remind, remembers him, Lois Leverett, who wrote a letter to a friend saying that she detested the Reverend Samuel Shuttleworth, who delighted in hurting his wife's feelings in public. But she knew such gossip to be wrong and considered the poor impression it might make on her friend to say so. So now we've got the minister who's in trouble for walking to church with holding his wife's hand, and the other one who makes, who, who makes his wife uh, a mockery in public. Uh, we have Samuel Williams. Samuel Williams is, one, is probably the most important person in terms of the contributions to Vermont. He was the first real historian of Vermont. He wrote a history of Vermont in 1794. He co-founded the Rutland Herald. He was the leading scientist of Vermont and was sent on special missions to the north to, to set the boundaries of the state. And uh, in, up to this point, I have thought he was, if we were going to put 10 faces up there that made Vermont, he would be one of them. Um, but only in the reading on, he was also a congregational minister in uh, Rutland, and he gave the election sermon in 1794. Uh, but it turns out that uh, you look into his history, uh, he, he, in 1780, he went to Harvard. Uh, in 1780, he became Hollis Professor of Mathematics and Natural Philosophy and was about to assume the presidency of Harvard College, but then left under a cloud in 1788. That is just six years before he became the election sermon man. A, la a, a later Bradford minister stated, I have heard it called forgery, which led to his instant resignation, and he went away from the metropolis of culture and refinement, from the society where he had been so honored, to the then new and backwoods town of Rutland. He had great learning and ability, but there was this sad episode in his life which destroyed the fame of a life that promised so much. But he came to Vermont, and what happens when people come to Vermont from a sad experience somewhere else? They flourish. He became, it was the second act, and he was allowed to become one of our major characters, always probably fearing something would reveal this, I suppose. But listen to his voice. Um, this is, he's, he's telling the, the legislators uh, his role. The, the, the business of the pulpit is not to direct our civil rulers what measures they are to pursue in public affairs, but to suggest those moral and religious considerations which are of the highest authority and obligation and lie upon them with peculiar weight. And then he introduces a, a subject which is common throughout, which is faction, party, uh, under Thomas Chittenden, we were one party, and after that, it became Republicans and, uh, and uh, Federalists. Uh, interestingly enough, religions followed politics. The, the Episcopalians and the Unitarians tended to become Tories, or I mean, not Tories, but uh, Federalists, and the Methodists and the Baptists tended to become Republicans, and it was a, a, a kind of a secular and religious separation of people. And if you, you, you see this tension all the way through the early years from 1778 to about the 1820s. And then all of a sudden, religion gets interested in social issues like slavery, abolition of slavery, like temperance, like Sabbath breaking, that sort of thing. And these movements are non-denominational and they bring the Protestant sects at least together in a way which allows them to take concrete action. So we have prohibition in 1852 after a long struggle. Uh, 
We were abolitionists long before the rest of the country. There was a South Carolina legislature was so upset with our abolitionism that they had a uh, resolution to the President of the United States that he should hire 10,000 Irish workers to dig a trench around the state of Vermont, float it out to sea, and drown it. Uh, which, if my geography is right, means that so would Maine and some of Quebec go as well. But um, So we have, I'm, I'm conscious of taking more time than I should since I read somewhere about a sermon that no souls are saved after 20 minutes. <laughs> but bear with me because there's some really wonderful things here. Um, this is... Uh, a man named uh, Thomas Merrill, who uh, stands out as the least tolerant of the, uh, the, the ministers. Um, he said, uh, it sounds like he's going that way, but he says, religion, religion cools the fire am of ambition in a successful man to give him a serenity of mind in the midst of the whirl of business, to teach him the instability of earthly things, the frailty of his own frame, the vanity of world enjoyments and the importance of laying up a treasure where moth and rust doth not corrupt. It pours oil and balm in the wounds of those who are brought down by the arrows of misfortune. It checks the ardor and impetuosity of the youth, counsels, cautions, advises, and leads him in the path of reputation and usefulness to the goal where he receives these laurels. But he openly criticized the religion of the Koran for arming its followers with the impediments of torture and bloodshed to exterminate all who will not implicitly embrace it. No one listening would have missed his message about godliness and its role in governing the nation. And uh, he speaks, in, but his sermon uh, uh, has vital images at the beginning, this moth and rust doth corrupt, but somehow at the end of his sermon it becomes, I, and I think what, what, uh, what ministers at this time have done is that they have internalized the, the kinds of things they'll say in a sermon, so they very well might be extemporaneous at some point. Um, the, uh, was the one I was looking for was uh, Elijah Lyman of Brookfield, a good but not a great man, said his biographer. Uh, the fault was that his government and his family was too much like Eli's, and he lived to see the fruit of this fault in a bad life and the end of a dear son. Uh, I don't know any more about that than that. But he was loved. Everyone felt that Father Lyman was his or her friend. The children felt so. He bent over the sick bed with deep compassion. He took little children in his arms and laid his hand on them and prayed. He visited all the district schools twice a term. He closed these visits with a catechism and a prayer. He was not a great preacher, <coughs> but he was so kind and tender that everybody loved to hear him. His sermon was, had more heads than any creature has a right to. Usually ended his <coughs> forenoon discourse with the remainder of this subject with leave of providence will be attended to in the afternoon. And the <laughs> pulpit at uh, Brookfield was very high, and Deacon Kellogg sat so near the base that he had to look up at the preacher at more than a 40-degree angle. With his lower jaw dropped, he swallowed at the end of each section of the sermon, and young people said he was swallowing the preaching, and so he was. Uh, Elijah had a reputation locally as a, as a mediator, settling suits that would otherwise have been taken to court. And at the end of one successful session in Rochester, he said, we have got the fire most out, but you may find some sparks now and then, and if you do, run for a bucket of water and quench it as soon as possible. Um, Phineas Peck, 1817, the first to be openly uh, critical of the uh, uh, Catholic religion. Uh, and uh, this is the one I was thinking of. Uh, he says, uh, of a if our charities are not exhausted, if our sympathies are not paralyzed, if our affections are not colder than the frozen poles, we hope the pulpit and press will groan for the miseries of the oppressed. The trumpet ought to sound long and loud until the continent shall tremble and free herself of her sooty burden. That's a, a racist concept, by the way. Until all shall cry out, let them colonize, help them to colonize, we will colonize them. <coughs> 
We will, by the blessing of God, colonize, protect, and bless them until the king of nations shall grant them national privileges. And then he sees the future of the world as Protestantism takes over the world. The cruel arm of the Catholic Church, superstition would be broken. The inquisitions of Spain and Portugal will be overthrown. Violence will be heard no more. Nor would the influence of this unity stop there. The Persians who worship fire would feel the fire of the Holy Ghost. The Mohammedans who propagate their false religion with a sword, pierced with a two-edged sword of the gospel, would renounce their delusions and fall down and worship the Son of God. The religion of the Grand Lama in Tartary would give place to the worship of the true God, juggernaut in Hindustan, to which the human service sacrifices are offered, would be hewed in pieces, and even there, spiritual sacrifices would be offered to the God of heaven. Um, as I say, most of these sermons have been a little bit more tolerant of other religions, but um, it ended in 1834 for several reasons which have been explained, one of which was that by the time we got to 1834, ministers had thrown off that res resistance to giving political opinions and were starting to talk about these subjects which, while many in the audience agreed, were, seemed out of place in a way. But the main reason, according at least to Leonard Deming, who writes a postscript to this process at that time, is that the state had to buy dinners for all the ministers that came to these sessions. <laughs> and they thought that wasn't a useful amount of spend expenditure. So they ended it there. And, uh, and Deming somewhat callously says that he didn't notice there was any difference in the way that the, uh, uh, the legislature acted without an election sermon. Um, today we don't have election sermons. We have chaplains, chaplains uh, who appear regularly. If they don't, then a legislator appears. And they start the day with a prayer in the Senate and the House. And there's a statute that says they should be paid $5 for their services that day. Uh, we have, uh, and we, but if we go back to the, where these statistics that I was telling you about, and I, I think what we've got now is that if you think about at the beginning, we had Congregationalists as the majority religion in the state, and, and it was said that 54% of the uh, people in Vermont were Congregationalists at the time, mostly on the eastern side of the state, which also happened to be where uh, the, the last outpost of, of Toryism with the people that resisted the independence of Vermont. The western side was said to be with Methodists and Baptists was to be a little bit unruly. Congregationalists were, were conservatives and I think it's also interesting to see how often <clears throat> a minister of a particular faith becomes a minister of another faith. Many of them uh, change their mind or their churches change and they kick them out. Uh, more than a third of, this, of them end their careers by becoming missionaries. They go to South Carolina and Georgia to treat with the, to supply religion to the Indians who have been moved around. And one is actually sent to Honolulu to try to uh, expand the religion at that time. But uh, sadly enough, some of them suffered more than that. William S. Perkins, the Episcopalian minister uh, in Arlington, was the founder of the first Episcopal church there and it was very successful, and he went to Montpelier and gave the election sermon, and when he got back, he was accused of evangelical leanings. And the Bishop of Vermont, Bishop Hopkins, came to Arlington and had a trial and dismissed him from the ministry because of what he had said, except that they, he did have a little caveat that if he could you know, repent that everything would be all right. So an hour later, he produced a letter which satisfied everyone and he was restored to his ministry at that time. Others have, uh, other, one, one minister went really bad and became a lawyer. Uh, several, it seemed as though you don't retire as a minister, though they always would, they would be thrown out in some way. They would be, the church would get rid of them. There was a, there was a lot of fighting over how much they were paid. Early on, we didn't have money, so we were to pay them in wood and, and uh, wheat and you know, goods. 
but no, people after a while forgot doing that. So they, we have a minister who's going to come to your house and pray with you because he wants to have dinner. Uh, and it, it becomes difficult. And uh, again, this, uh, we have Chandler walking from uh, Waitsfield. Um, the minister in uh, my town, uh, James Hobart, at the end of his 40 years as the pastor for the Congregational Church, said he was tired and he wanted to retire. And they had a town meeting where they were going to see if they could pay, sort of give him his pension. And it was so angry and so distraught that they the moderator, my predecessor, uh, adjourned the meeting without any action being taken and he didn't get anything. So he proceeded to become an itinerant minister and he would walk from Berlin to Plainfield. He would walk, sometimes he'd walk 100 miles at a time and go to church to church and take, as, and could, you, could I take your Sunday service? Um, sometimes the ministers would have five or six churches and they would have to move around uh, even if they were close enough in that day to do it. it they're, they are remarkable uh, men, they're all men, they're remarkable sermons, and, and I re feel really proud of having the opportunity to, to read them. I have to say that the experience of reading them is not, uh, it takes some getting used to. So I find myself, I'm not giving due respect to the ministers if I'm not listening to them, and if I get the feeling like I'm lost, I have to stop for a day and sort of clear my head in a way. But what I've seen, but the opportunity here is greater than just the history of, of election sermons. The, uh, the opportunity is to tell the history of Vermont for the first 60 years because of what they say about the issues of the day in their sermons. And while I was really looking for a development or an evolution of religious thought, I was really surprised that they all seemed pretty much the same, other than the Episcopalians that seemed to want to talk seriously about why a bishop is more important than uh, election of the minister by the, uh, by the congregation. But largely there is no miracles, very little depravity, you know, in all, all this uh, sort of Calvinist burden. I, 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 I've extended my reach to read some of the early sermons of George Whitefield, and those sermons are filled with wrath and, you know, Jonathan Edwards with, with uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. So the, the audience would break down and, uh, uh, and weep and, and this would be the biggest event of their life. This didn't happen in the legislature. The legislature was a little too starchy. There was a little, little less of that. But imagine an hour. I mean, mo in many years they would have the militia of the town, meet the governor outside as he came into town, and they would come in, there would be cannons shot off and guns, and then they, would, then they would go to the legislature and they would elect the speaker and swear in all the legislators, and then they would stand up and listen to a sermon for an hour. Now that's different kind of folks than I'm thinking of today. <laughs> I didn't make you stand for this lecture, <laughs> and this isn't a sermon, but uh, today, I think I saw that 3% of, of Vermonters consider themselves Congregationalists and 20-some percent are Catholics. And, uh, and I've seen uh, figures unsubstantiated that 40% are Deists. So maybe Ethan didn't really lose his way after all. Thank you. It's a starchy subject, but if you have questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Yes. Um, I have a couple of comments. Um, I served for many years at First Congregational in, um, in Burlington, which started in 1805. Yeah. Um, two ministers uh, by two different committees, neither one of them knowing the other one existed, were called to interview for the position of, of uh, first pastor. Uh, one was from Yale. And Yale was the um, stronghold of the congregation. Right. The other one was Harvard, and Harvard deist slash Unitarian. So the two of them came, and they had there was only one place for them to stay in the in, in the uh, the home of the uh, uh, whoever it was in the church that, that called them. And the two guys got along really well, but the congregations went, and so they separated. So one one became Congregational, and the other one became Unitarian. And uh, the Unitarian Church started five years 
later than the UCC. But but that is just a lovely piece of history there. <laughs> but I had read that the minister that became the congregational of the first minister was paid four hundred fifty dollars cash a year, uh, which compared to some of those small towns was was okay. incredible. Yeah. And he was president of the university at the same yeah, time. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there were three, uh, two university presidents, University of Vermont presidents, and three Middlebury uh, presidents who, who spoke. And uh, my old friend Asa Burton, he, they kept asking him back, but he, he only did it twice. But uh, it's, it, it's an interesting group of people. That, that it's interesting. I, I was concerned that in reading these sermons that I would be at sea, so I decided I would start reading them from the newest backwards so that I would at least have a chance to get into the flavor of it. But um, I can't say that, that I saw that much difference. I think some of the better ones were the, were the earlier ones in a way. But. So you, th this is, what is this going to be? A book? A pamphlet? I don't know what it is. I, I'm still wrestling with it. But I've still got 20 to do thoroughly, and uh, I can't wait. So. <laughs> Thanks very much.